Welcome to today's program, Story Survive, The Extraordinary Life of Yaffa Eliak with Smidar Rosenzweig. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Now in its 25th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resistance against injustice, and more. Uh, thank you for joining us today virtually. We hope you will visit the museum in person to see our new core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, alongside our temporary exhibitions, Boris Lurie, Nothing to Do But to Try, which closes today, and Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust from photographer Martin Scholler, running through June 18th. You can learn more and find tickets on our website. We appreciate the vital support of our members so much here at the museum. If you want to get closer to the museum and enjoy exclusive programs, member previews to exhibitions, and free admission, you can explore museum membership on our website or email membership at mjhnyc.org to learn more. Closed captions are available on today's program. Instructions on how to turn captions on or off will be posted in the chat, in addition to all the links I've mentioned. If you have questions for our speaker during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Today, we are honored to be joined by Smidar Rosenzweig. Smidar is a world-renowned Jewish educator and lecturer in Bible. She is a clinical associate professor of Bible and Judaic studies at Stern College for Women, Yeshiva University. She received her BA from Barnard College and her MA and um, M, uh, MPhil uh, from Columbia University in Jewish history, where she studied under Professor Yosef uh, Chaim Yerushalmi and was a presidential fellow. Previously, she was a professor of Judaic studies at Lander College for Women, Toro College. Thank you again for joining us. Um, and now I'm gonna pass things over to Smidar. Hi, thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Smadar Eliach Rosenzweig and I am the daughter of Dr. Yaffa Eliach Alea Shalom. My mother's sixth yurtzeit, the day of her passing was just this week the 8th of Cheshvan in the Jewish calendar and will be this week, November 8th. She passed away in 2016. I would like to thank the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust for spearheading this program, Stories Survive. My mother was a pioneer in understanding the power of personal testimony and telling your personal story in commemorating life before, during and after the Holocaust. I want to thank the museum for the vision to advance Jewish memory and history. We hope to continue developing this relationship for many years to come. The earliest original interviews and artifacts from the first Center for Holocaust Studies that my mother established are housed herein in the museum. It was the original archival core of the museum. How do you describe my mother? Survivor, historian, author, pioneer, trailblazer, scholar, poet, teacher, professor, lecturer, wife, mother, grandmother, great grandmother. She was all that. In one word, a real woman of value, a valor, superwoman. During her active years, she was larger than life. She was a devoted mother who sewed beautiful clothes for her children, embroidered tablecloths, cooked, baked, attended our plays, loved us, listened to us. She always set a festive table with pizzazz and had flowers and lit candles as a centerpiece. She was glamorous and down to earth at the same time. All my friends adored her. She had the it factor. Her enthusiasm and dynamism and idealism were infectious. She loved people. She wanted to be a part of their life. She connected with people. She was a mother who wove elaborate stories and had a way with the spoken and written word. She was like life itself, a force of nature. At times, as if she had boundless energy and creativity. She loved her grandchildren and would shower them with personalized gifts and cards and hugs and her delicious grandmother cookies, safta cookies and stories. My mother loved celebrating happy occasions. She even commissioned a stunning embroidered chuppah wedding canopy for the marriages of her grandchildren. My father, Rabbi David Eliach of blessed memory, who passed away a year ago at the age of 99, and my mother were a team, a formidable team. Both were powerhouses in their respective fields of interest, very independent, but also a very strong unit. They built a wonderful family together and contributed to the Jewish community together. My brother, Rabbi Yotav Eliach, and I were very fortunate to grow up in this wonderful household. 
I am here today as a second generation to tell my mother's story and her family's story, to speak to them for them because they cannot speak for themselves anymore. I am here as the child of a survivor to tell you my mother's impact on me, my family and the world. I am here to commemorate and remember because she cannot remember or commemorate anymore. I and my family are here because she instilled in us the imperative of remembrance, of communal responsibility, nobility of spirit, and the clarion cry of educating the world about the beauty of Jewish life and its values. I am here as a daughter to bear witness and to tell her story to commemorate the dead and the living. My mother, Yaffa, Shana, and Yiddish, son and son, was born May 31st, 1935, in a hospital in Vilna, but she was from the town of Eshishok, Eshishkis. They were a typical or a special Lithuanian Jewish community. Her parents, Moshe and Sipora Sonenzon, her paternal grandparents were Shaul and Chaya Sonenzon, and her maternal grandparents were Yitzchak Uri and Alta Yehudit Katz. My mother can trace her family's 900 year ancestry in the Lithuanian shtetl of Eshishok back to the original Jewish settlers. Her paternal grandparents and her father and his family were owners of the wax factory, the tannery, a fur business and a lumber business. Her grandmother Chaya was very involved in the community's charitable organizations. Her maternal grandparents, the Katzes, owned a pharmacy and a photography studio in the back of the pharmacy. My mom, mother remembered vividly spending many meals and hours with her grandmothers. The families were religious, observant, and the many traditions of Shabbat and family meals, prayers in the synagogue played a very central role in her life. My mother Yaffa went to market selling candles with grandma Sonenzon, who, who was really a very special and strong personality. And my mother also assisted her grandmother Alta Katz and her mother Tsipora in the photography studio. When her grandfather traveled to America to receive an apothecary degree, he brought back a camera to supplement the income of the pharmacy. Many of the photographs that were taken in the shtetl and what you see today were the work of my grandmother and great-grandmother, and the originals bear the crimp stamp of her studio. Many of the photographs in the Eshishuk archive and in the Tower of Faces in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington were taken by my mother, but really my grandmother and my great-grandmother. My mother remembers the town as a happy place, skating in winter, swimming in summer. She felt very secure growing up in the bosom of family and the shtetl. In the summers, they rented a dacha, a summer home in the country. In June, in 1941, June 23rd, the Germans occupied Eshishok, when my mother and her family were in their summer dacha, the summer home in Titianse. My mother's grandmother, Alta Katz, took what will have become the last pre-war pictures of my mother in her gingham dress with her father and brother and mother. These were the last pictures of my mother and her family as free individuals before the war. And this will be the last photograph that my great grandmother would ever take in her life. My grandparents went back to their shtetl and my grandmother gave birth to a baby boy just a few months later. My grandfather Moshe Sonnenzon was suspicious from the beginning of 1940, when all the Jewish refugees were streaming into town, that there'll be a catastrophe for the Jews, even in Eshishok. He wanted the extended family to escape. He made plans, but everyone thought he was being negative. Didn't he remember how wonderful the Germans were towards the Jews during World War I? They were so cultured. They appreciated the Jews. They also reprimanded him. Family togetherness is a strength. How could he think of breaking up the family? There were hundreds of family members in town to, which, to whom they were very connected. My grandfather made arrangements to hide his wife Tsipora and their baby son in a nearby town. He made arrangements for his son Yitzchak and Yaffa, my mother, to hide in separate locations. My mother was hidden with Zosha, her non-Jewish babysitters. The Germans announced that the Jews should all congregate in the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah 1941, the Jewish New Year. On the second day of Rosh Hashanah, September 21st, 1941, the German Einsatzgruppen and their local collaborators stripped and shot all the men, 
They made the Jews dig pits and strip them and shot them and put them into the pit in the middle of the potato fields. On the next day, Tsom Gedalia, Gimel Tishrei, September 22nd, all the women were stripped and shot. Most of the town's thousands of Jewish residents, along with most of my mother's extended family, were murdered by machine gun fire as they were forcibly assembled around massive graves that they dug themselves in the potato fields surrounding the town. In two days, a mere 48 hours, centuries of Jewish life, love and lore were buried with the 3,446 residents of Eishishok, young and old. This process continued throughout September 25th and 26th, when another approximately 1,500 Jews were murdered from the surrounding towns as well. During what my mother called the Shechita, my mother was so distraught by all the tumult and asked Zosha, her babysitter, to see what was happening. And they went out just to see what was going on. And they almost took my mother to the killing fields as well. And she barely escaped with Zosha. My grandfather escaped from the synagogue. He was making a last ditch effort to convince other family members, please come escape. But he was not successful. So he jumped out the window of the synagogue to find his family. By the time the massive execution took place, he was barely able to save his wife and three children. It took a few days for him to join everyone, but he succeeded and they made their way to Raden, a nearby town, thinking that that was more stable. Soon Raden became an enclosed ghetto and their life was hard, overcrowded, horrible conditions, limited food, but sometimes they were able to smuggle food from the outside. And my grandmother ran the illegal Hebrew class. My mother Yaffa tells this story that she was once able to smuggle into the ghetto a piece of candy when she escaped to the outside. And she showed it to her mother. And her mother said, Yaffa, we have to cut it up into little tiny pieces so everyone, all the other kids could share the sweetness. Even in terrible times, my grandmother told my mother, we have to keep our chesed, our charity, our sense of justice, our sense of righteousness, our sense of humanity. My mother always said that her mother's act was a great lesson for her throughout her life. And it really reverberated in her mind throughout her family life, her professional life, and inspired her to do what she did. They were in the ghetto till May 1942. One night during an action, while they were hiding in an attic with other families to escape the Nazi roundup, my mother's baby, my mother's baby brother was suffocated to death so he would not cry and endanger the others. My grandfather Moshe realized that he must find a safe haven and he cannot stay anywhere close and they have to be separate. He made arrangements for shelter in exchange for 60 or 80 rubles of gold a month. My grandfather hid gold in several places preparing for the Holocaust. And he told a Polish noble, Kazmierz Korkuch, a bachelor with whom he had business dealings that he will make a deal with him, please hide us. And my grandfather Moshe felt that Korkuch owed him a favor since my grandmother's parents Moshe's in-laws, Alta and Uri Katz, saved Korkuch during World War I. They sheltered him. Later, during the Lindsay administration, my mother brought Korkuch to America to receive the hero's welcome as one of Hasidei Umot Taolam, a righteous Gentile. And he received the keys to New York City, national honors, and in Israel, and also a monetary trust for him and his family, because my mother never forgot his kindness. My mother would constantly befriend her non-Jewish neighbors wherever she lived, primarily because she was really just a friendly, optimistic, and idealistic individual, despite the Holocaust. She was caring about everybody and felt that everyone was created in the image of God and everyone should be brothers. But we always teased her that she was preparing for another Holocaust-like escape. Well, Kazmiros Korkoch did take them in. Korkoch took them in and they survived in a cramp and damp underground cave-like dwelling on Korkuch's estate under a pigsty. There, in terrible, awful conditions, 
and in lice and dirt. My grandmother Tzipora taught my mother Yaffa and her brother Yitzchak to read by writing on the damp wall. And they continued their traditions by telling stories and to keep the Jewish memories and rituals alive, whatever they could do. But one day, the Armia Krajowa, the Polish underground, which wanted to rid Poland of all the Germans and the Jews, was suspicious that Korkus was hiding Jews. And one night in December 1942, brought him in for questioning and tortured him mercilessly. Korkus returned and tearfully told my mother's family they had to escape. They fled during a blizzard in 1943 and wandered like vagabonds under pigsties, potato sheds, and in open forests until February 1944. By then, my grandmother Tsipora was four months pregnant. And my grandfather came to Korkoch and begged him, please, we must come back to you. My wife needs to be in a stable place and to give birth. He took them in and they returned to their original cave under Korkoch's pigsty. And Monday, June 8th, my grandmother Tsipora gave birth to a baby boy in the stable. They unofficially named the baby Chaim after my great grandmother Chaya Sonenzon. And they put the baby in a basket with flax and money and tied it to the eaves of a local Polish priest. And in July 1944, after they were liberated by the Russians, my mother's family returned to Eshishok. They retrieved the young baby, circumcised him, and officially named him. People came from far and wide. <gasps> a bris, a Jewish baby, a miracle. How could a family survive? They were one of the few intact families that survived in the area where the war really was ravaging. They and a handful of survivors celebrated Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur and Sukkot that year, happy to be alive, but shocked by the worldwide devastation. They also returned to virulent anti-Semitism. Jig, why'd you come back? Jews, go back to the grave. Most of the locals were very unhappy that they were back. And these hateful individuals did not want to part with the possessions and real estate that they took from the Jews. And on Gimel Cheshvan, October 20th, 1944, riots and attacks broke out against the Jews in Eshishok. My grandfather Moshe wanted the entire family to jump again out the windows and run for their lives into the forest. But my grandmother refused. It would be sure death for her infant son. She already experienced that before in Radin. And she told them, leave without me. My grandfather refused. He said, we made it until now together and nothing can break us apart. They ran up to the bedroom and attic crawl space to hide. The mob, led by longtime neighbors, found the attic door and shot my grandmother and the newborn baby. They sprayed shots wildly through the small door. But my mother Yaffa, my uncle Yitzchak, and grandfather Moshe were, spray were spared death. My grandmother's dead body fell back, covering my mother and saving their lives as a last act of love of a mother. My grandfather went out to seek those who perpetrated these murders. Soon after my grandfather was taken into jail and sentenced to prison in a hard labor camp in Kazakhstan. And he was there for over a decade. When my brother saw that his father was arrested, he left for the partisans and my mother was left all alone. During the entire four years of hiding, starvation, escape, and terrible sickness, the family survived together. And now, after the Holocaust, her whole family was shattered. Her life was shattered. What should she do now? Where should she turn? How much trauma could a young girl survive? My mother Yaffa remained in Eshishok and several different families or people or partisans took care of her. And finally, her uncle Shalom and new wife Miriam took her in and promised Moshe, who was in jail, that they would bring her to Israel. My mother Yaffa was a spunky handful and got into a lot of mischief, not only in the shtetl, but also in their journey throughout Europe. Throughout their travels in Soviet territory, they had to be very cautious because Yaffa's father, Moshe, was considered a Soviet insubordinate and he was an arrested criminal. And Yaffa was traveling as Sholem and Merila's daughter. In Prague, by accident, my mother said her real name, and they had to escape from that city. In Carlsbad, Aunt Miriam gave birth, but they had to move quickly to arrive in American occupied territory. Finally, they arrived in American controlled Germany and Yaffa, my mother contracted the mumps and was very sick. So she was sent in an ambulance to the hospital, but she ended up in a convent and no one knew where to visit her because my great uncle Sholem did not know where she was. 
In the convent, Yaffa heard the sisters planning to convert her since she was an unclaimed Jewish child. But one nun, whom my mother called her guardian angel, Schwester Henrietta, Sister Henrietta, felt that that was unjust. And she looked all over for her family and found her uncle and aunt and reunited her with them. Finally, they were coming closer to the port to sail to Egypt. In March 1944, my uncle Shalom finally received a permit to enter Palestine via Egypt. The British were in control of Palestine at the time and were letting very few Jews in. But Uncle Sholem had a British passport. How, you may ask? Because he made Aliyah to Eretz Israel and lived there for a few years. He returned to the shtetl because his parents were worried about his physical safety, his religious safety in Palestine. Surely Europe is safer. And they demanded that he returned home. And he did return home. But never in their worst nightmares could they envision the horrible Holocaust that ensued, decimating their entire extended family in shtetl. Uncle Sholem's original first wife and two daughters died in the Holocaust, but his papers included a wife and two daughters. And as a result, Sholem was able to procure a permit to enter British Mandate Palestine with a wife and two children. They traveled by cramped ship and took a train to British, British Mandate Palestine. On the train, 10 days before Pesach from Egypt to Israel, they shared the car with animals and a few refugees. The woman next, sitting next to Yaffa asked her name and where she came from, and she told her, my father is Moshe, my mother is Tipora, and I'm coming out of the slavery of Egypt to the, from the land of the Pharaoh to the freedom of Israel. And the lady thought she was lying and said, oh, what chutzpah, such a little girl and already a consummate liar. But my uncle said, no, her uncle said, no, she's telling the truth. But the woman looked unconvinced. There's another version of this family in the family lore that my mother told this to the border police and he slapped her on the face and he said chutzpah look how young the people are already being so full of moxie and having no respect for their elders on april 5th 1946 they arrived in british mandate palestine and lived in an apartment in yushalayim when they settled in yushalayim my mother was just getting used to life in israel she saw a funeral and she saw so many people following one person who was killed and she said wow why are so many people crying after just one person who died? And she found that it was difficult to integrate into Israel. And she decided, OK, I'm not going to talk about my story so much. I am going to speak fluent Hebrew, which she knew since her mother taught her Hebrew. And she didn't speak much about her experience in Poland and of the Holocaust in Israel. She is now going to be like a Sabra. Her uncle changed their last name from Sononzon, which is more Yiddish, to Ben Shemesh, which means the same thing, the son of light, the son of the sun. And a new Sabra, Yaffa Ben Shemesh, was born. My uncle, my great uncle, having done his part that he brought Yaffa to safety, said, OK, now you have to go to boarding school. I promised that I would bring you to Israel. So she attended a boarding school, Tel Ranan, and after that she went to Kvarbacha, which was uh, an academic school. She always wanted to be an academic. She wanted to learn. She wanted to make sure that she had a good education. Her mother was very educated and she wanted to continue in those footsteps. And in school, she studied literature, poetry, history. She was very involved in sports and she was always chosen to be the school representative and to speak at all their special occasions. She was excelling in everything. In 1953, she married her teacher and principal, Rabbi David Eliach. So 1953, after graduation, she was married. And in 1953, she sent in her papers to be accepted into the United States. But because that was during a very difficult time for people either from Israel or that were connected to any kind of youth organization or originally were from Vilna, Poland, because of the fear of communism, it took until 1954 for my mother to be granted entrance to the United States. And originally my mother was an elementary school teacher, but she realized that was not for her. So she went to Brooklyn College in the evenings 
and received her BA in history from Brooklyn College and her MA in 1969. Originally, my mother was an expert in Russian intellectual history and she received her PhD in 1973. However, even though her dissertation was about the Baal Shem Tov, the originator of Hasidism, she decided that she wants to delve more into shtetl history and Eastern European history because there wasn't enough work done on it. And she wanted to make sure that the world would never forget. And in the early 70s, early on her, in her tenure at Brooklyn College, she crafted a course exclusively on the Holocaust. No one had done it before. She herself struggled to find appropriate primary and secondary sources. The multimedia footage that she screened for the class all depicted Jews as soulless, haunting victims that were led like sheep, like sheep to the slaughter. The first semester papers horrified her. All the paper sources were from books that quoted exclusively from Nazi documentation and used ex extremely derogatory terms about the Jews. The students were using this phraseology even though they were writing in their own voice. And my mother realized that the entrenched Nazi imagery of Jewish victimization and demonization was just so powerful. And this had to change. There were few sources authored by Jews. There was the diary of Anne Frank, but there weren't enough voices coming from the Jewish community, Jewish voices. Most importantly, she wanted the Jews to have an impact on the dialogue surrounding World War II. She wanted to make sure that people knew that Holocaust meant the destruction of the Jews and that Nazi Germany also had local collaborators. She wanted to make sure people knew the facts. She wanted to make sure that people were careful about language. And she wanted to make sure people spoke about the heroism of the Jews, choices made because you couldn't leave your family. She championed the greatness of human spirit that was really revealed in everyone that really stood up in any way they could against what was going against them. She initiated the idea of interviewing survivors of concentration camps, ghettos, work camps, hiding partisans, righteous Gentiles, liberators, and others. It wasn't mainstream in historical scholarly community to interview, to do oral history. She was swimming against the tide, but that did not deter my mother. She realized she must press forward and interview as many survivors as she can, collect as much material as she can before the survivors will not be able to testify anymore. And she wanted to make sure the images were of a thriving, loving Jewish community and not only of victims. She originally recruited her Brooklyn College students to interview survivors. Now it's the main mode and was for a while while the survivors were alive of Holocaust commemoration, but she was a pioneer and she inspired Steven Spielberg to really start his oral history project. In 1974, my mother established a Center for Holocaust Studies documentation and research, the first of its kind in the United States to forward all these important goals. And one of her most famous books is Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust that was published in 1982, which relates the spiritual heroism of Jews during the Holocaust. She was the first to accentuate the experience of the religious community and to emphasize and highlight the importance of spiritual resistance and the central role that women played before, during and after the Holocaust. She gave the survivors life, a voice, and her genius was to recreate their life for us, their heroism and their unique inner world. As my mother wrote in her introduction to Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust, these stories demonstrate the ability of the individual to transcend the historical reality of one's surroundings and endow the pain and suffering with personal hope and optimism, even in the valley of death. Evil is transient and good always must prevail. My mother really felt that the world was good and she was optimistic. And if you teach people and people understand, then they are going to be good and they will really fight against evil. At a time when human beings were stripped of everything, even their names, the only resource remaining to them was their inner spiritual strength, their dignity. And this dignity was the very essence of their existence. This was my mother's goal, to give everyone a voice, to give them a face, a name, a story, 
She grasped the importance of telling stories, of emphasizing detail and individuality, words and images. She created curricula to teach the lessons of the Holocaust to safeguard that it will never happen again. She realized that people will only internalize the tragedy if they feel a kinship, a connection with those who perished and identify with them. One of her books and exhibits about child survivors was titled, We Were Children Just Like You. In 1976, the presidential election between Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter took place. To show his support to the Jews and his sensitivity to the large community of Holocaust survivors, President Ford visited my mother's Holocaust Center. As we all know, Gerald Ford lost the election and Jimmy Carter won. But in 1979, President Carter was inspired by his opponent's interest in the Holocaust, and my mother was asked to join the President Carter Commission, Holocaust Commission, which was which founded and built the museum as part of the Smithsonian Institution on the National Mall. In 1979, the commission traveled to the concentration camps in Eastern Europe, and my mother was inspired to continue her research on the shtetl, but to focus more on her shtetl of Eishishok and collect testimonies and interview every survivor that she could to collect memorabilia and a picture of it, each and every member of the town. And she begins the Yaffa Eliyach shtetl collection and documents with pictures and oral history, starting with just a handful of family photos, some that my mother and brother saved in their shoes when they were when they escaped that fateful uh, September and October in 1941. My mother spent 15 years traveling all over the United States and the globe, searching for photographs, diaries, letters from other shtetl residents. And my mother ultimately collected 6,000 photographs of townspeople, a lot of the pictures that you saw earlier in the program, posing in family and school groups, and was able to find pictures for 92% of the shtetl's slaughtered Jews. Most of these photographs, as we said earlier, were taken by my maternal great-grandmother, Alta Katz, and my mother, Tsipora. When my maternal great-grandfather came back and he returned with the camera, it was really fateful. It really helped preserve my mother's shtetl, the shtetl of Eishishok. My mother selected 1,500 of these pictures for the Holocaust Museum Tower of Faces that my mother designated for her the Tower of Life, because for her, it portrayed the vibrancy of the shtetl. And by 2016, 40 million people visited the museum since its opening in 1993. And many choose my mother's exhibit as the most impactful. My mother also assembled hundreds of photographs and oral histories into an enormous book, an 818 page book, There Once Was a World, a 900 year chronicle of the shtetl of Eishishok in 1998. And it was a nonfiction finalist for the National Book Award. The title originated with my grandfather, Moshe Sonnenzon, who would always sigh and introduce his stories about the shtetl with Amolus Gevena Welt, there once was a world. And at my wedding, he was pleased with my mother's ambitions for the shtetl. His last event was to come to my wedding. He came from Israel to my wedding. We danced at the wedding and we had many survivors from Eishishok at the wedding and of course extended family members. And he passed away at the celebrations after my wedding that Friday night. I got married Tuesday and Friday night he passed away from a, a massive heart attack uh, in the middle of our celebrations. But at the wedding, he was so excited to be there and to see what was going on. And he said, oh, you're commemorating the shtetl? At least the people, and perhaps even God, will remember that there once was a world filled with faith, Judaism, and humanity. My mother also started a project to actually recreate the, st the shtetl in Israel, but it did not materialize. In 2000, 2006 and 2007, my mother's exhibit, A Blessing to One Another, Pope John Paul II and the Jewish People, was exhibited here in the Museum of Jewish Heritage, highlighting the Pope's enduring friendship with Jews. My mother never lost her hope 
about the importance of brotherhood, all humanity being connected together for good causes, and that people who did good things should definitely be remembered for their good deeds. A few years ago, our family donated the vast archive of Eishishok and this archive about the Pope to Yad Vashem. We hope that cataloging and digitizing will begin in earnest and scholars and laymen will be encouraged to research this vast and unique archive and also her huge archive that is in the Museum of Jewish Heritage and that we hope that there will be more as time goes on, as we go through my mother's papers. And also she has a huge vast exhibit, as we know, in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. And just this month, a children's book by Hanna Stiefel telling my mother's story was published, The Tower of Life, How Yaffa Eliach Rebuilt Her Town in Stories and Photographs. My mother's message is still relevant and has such implications, not only for adults, but for, for all ages. In the end, to finish my mother's story and legacy, I just want to end with my youngest daughter, Elisheva's observation from when she was a teenager. I am inspired by my grandmother's utter perseverance and ambition to live a life of hope and meaning despite the traumatic challenges she faces throughout her life. She rebuilt her life despite all the odds, not by forgetting the past, but by grasping at every strand of hope and light that presented itself and using that to motivate her and push her forward, forward to achieve greatness and impact others. She never thought of her story as a burden, rather as a lesson, a commemoration that should be shared with the world and impact those who are willing to listen. She always signed her books with the phrase, a little light chases away a vast darkness. It is our duty to pass on her flaming torch from one generation to the next. May her legacy shine forever. Thank you. Samandar, I wanna thank you so much for sharing your mother's story and for sharing all those photographs. It was really beautiful to um, learn about her story while also seeing um, all the things that she was able to save. Um, it's really amazing. Um, so I do wanna begin by asking you when you learned about your mother's experiences during the Holocaust and, and how did she explain the, that to you? Um, from a young age, my mother constantly told us stories. Uh, she wanted us to remember, and we were never too young or too inexperienced. She felt that we had to know the past, not only the beautiful stories of her family and her grandmothers, which she really told us from a very young age, but she wanted to make sure that we also knew the tragedy, that we realized that the um, evil in this world can really have a huge impact. And our job is to fight against it, to save and cherish our, our traditions and our wonderful life and family uh, is so important. And even if family is not here anymore, to tell their stories. And that's the way we uh, commemorate them. And before she collected the vast collection of pictures, she had some of these pictures that she had that was the core of her exhibit and the core of her collection. And she always showed them to us and they were very precious to her. And she said, they have to be precious to you because this is um, this is your history. And that's why I'm very gratified that Hannah Stiefel wrote this children's book about the Holocaust, which is very rare, but my mother really believed in that. You have to tell the stories because as you see by stories survive, stories survive. And the stories we tell and that each generation tells the story, which is such a Jewish tradition, memory, storytelling. That's the whole idea what the Passover Seder is about. And my mother really lived that, that you're never too young to learn about good. And you're also never too, learn, too young to learn about fighting um, against evil because the younger you learn these values, the longer and deeper they stay with you. It's amazing. I'm, I'm just so struck by how amazing of a woman she, she really was. Um, so I also want to ask you, you know, you talk, you, like your mother, you work in academia. Um, so do you feel that your mother's work and experiences have impacted your career path in any way? And if they have, um, how so? 
Um, absolutely. Um, for a woman and an Orthodox woman at that, and even just a Jewish woman to be uh, so successful in the world at large and to really go after her goals and to persevere despite everything that happened. Number one, that she was so optimistic. She really went through a terrible tragedy and that could have broken and did break a lot of people. And it was just so inspiring to see that she took all those lessons of, uh, of hate and of oppression and of the terrible tra tragedies that happened to her and turned into something positive. And, um, and she felt that everyone should learn that lesson. And she also really loved people. And uh, I really learned from her that having a goal, having a message, wanting to be um, impactful, having passion about what you do uh, really is uh, very important and having standards and working for them. And you can have family and you, it's difficult, but you can have family and you could be successful and you can try uh, your hand at all these things. And that's how, you know, we move forward. So she was really uh, very dynamic and someone who was very inspirational and she was doing this in the 60s and 70s and of course the 80s and 90s but it was really unusual so she really inspired uh me in that way um and do you feel that other parts of your identity have been shaped by being the child of a holocaust survivor um you know outside of your career path oh absolutely um I do see myself very strongly as a second generation uh, Holocaust survivor. And in, in the family, as a joke, they call me Bat HaShoah, the daughter of the Holocaust, um, because it really has uh, had a very huge impact. I see what's going on with anti Semitism and uh, different things around. And right away, I worry about what impact could have had it had because my grandfather, he said, look, we have to think about what's going on and we have to make sure it doesn't happen or make sure that we make a path and realize that things can get worse and to be vigilant. And I think that she's taught me to be vigilant and to make sure that we make sure it should never happen again. That's why she was teaching all these classes. That's why she wanted people to know about the Holocaust, not just because it's important to know it historically. It is. But beyond that, the message is should never happen again. And it's our job to be vigilant, to call out anti-Semitism and to make sure that we emphasize the commonality that we have with people, what we really share in humanity and never to look at the other person as the other. We're all part of the same image of God. And we all have this shared humanity. And that was something that was very uh, important uh, to my mother. And that was really a guiding force uh, in her Holocaust studies and commemoration. And she went to all different communities, Jewish, non-Jewish, all different races. She was really very ecumenical in her impact and in her drive and in her interest because she felt this is something that has to be taught to the world. That's amazing. Um, and you know, it's clear from listening to you, you know, how passionate you are about sharing your mother's story, but can you talk a little bit about the decision to, to, to continue speaking about your mother's story and, and what that has been like for you? Um, it really uh, helps me bring my mother back to life in a sense. I feel like just like she did the pictures and the um, oral testimonies that brought her shtetl to life, uh, this continues her legacy, which is so uh, important. Not only that it should be in archives and continued in museums, but we talk about it and we continue the story. At the end of my life, my, uh, sorry, at the end of my mother's life, she was very ill and could not tell uh, her own story anymore. And uh, from then, I felt uh, a very important um, responsibility to tell her story and continue her legacy because she really felt it passionately. And I think we have to have people who are passionate and also who believe in it to continue. And I hope that it's infectious and really uh, influences other people to tell their stories and even second generation, like I am, to look at the testimonies from the parents and grandparents 
to make sure that we remember the, their legacy and continue their stories and make sure that um, it should never happen again. And I think by personalizing and making everyone realize my mother's story and who she was, she was a person who decided to do this. And we all have a lot of free choice to make decisions and to make a big impact. And I think that um, to me, she was inspirational and to others, she was inspirational during her life. And I want her to continue that inspiration um, even now. That's amazing. And, um, and we thank you for, for sharing it with us. Um, so I think before we move into audience questions, I have one uh, kind of final question, which you've touched on a bit, but what are you hoping that people, um, you know, remember and, and take with them as they listen to your mother's story? Um, I want them to really understand um, how important learning about the Holocaust is that it's not passe, that it's not something that happened a while ago and doesn't uh, impact us today. It does because it was an, a, a confluence of such evil and such actions, but that was perpetrated uh, on a national and world level. And that she wanted to make sure that um, it, 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 would never, uh, it would never happen again. And I think just to understand that it should never happen again, that we are responsible, each and every one of us. We can't say, oh, someone else was responsible, meaning it's someone else's job to do that. It's someone else's job to answer that. It's someone else's job to fight against this. We have the responsibility. And I think that was a very important message that we have the responsibility not to forget. And by telling these stories, we're showing that it can happen but there are ways that we should act that it should never happen again, that knowledge is power and that it teaches us and helps us understand that these things can absolutely happen. She was very, very strong against the revisionists and against Nazi um, and Holocaust deniers that said it didn't happen. And that's what was very important for her because then you could say, oh, of course it didn't happen. It can't happen. It absolutely can happen. But we have tools, education, knowledge. We have to really speak up when we see these kind um, you know, of things happen. And I also want to emphasize that um, another aspect uh, of what my mother did, which was um, so impactful, are two things. Number one, that she, by her two books and her work, uh, Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust and There Once Was a World, commemorating her shtetl, but also spiritual hero heroism, she really melds both those messages. The idea that we have to remember and the details are important, but we also have to learn lessons from these details that will help us uh, move on and lead a, a good life. And um, we went to... Uh, Aishi Shok, she took the survivors and she took the families that were second generation and some third generation back to the shtetl. And we went and we saw a lot of the houses, not everything survived, but a lot of the houses survived and a lot was enough was intact that you really felt what was going on. And the um, killing fields, we said Kaddish on the graves. But when we walked through the shtetl and my mother was telling her story, I felt like it's almost as if I would be bringing my children to my neighborhood and showing them the neighborhood. And then, God forbid, a tragedy would happen. It really brought it home that it could happen anywhere if you're not vigilant. And I think that was very important for my mother. All ages have to know all different denominations, all different groups, ethnic groups, nationalities, because it's a lesson for everybody. It's a lesson to really promote peace and understanding and really the uh, idea of uh, harmony and of goodness. Thank you so much for sharing that. So I think now we have time for just a few audience questions in the last kind of 10 minutes. So the first one is just a kind of clarifying question. Um, your mother wrote The Tower of Life, correct, um, that book? My mother wrote the, um, the book, There Once Was a World. This world, correct. Okay. Being my mother wrote the book, There Once Was a World, which is uh, a, a book 
that tells the story of the shtetl of Eishishok, which is presented in the Tower of Life. The children's book that just came out, the Tower of Life, is a book by Hannah Stiefel that is telling my mother's story. Okay. Thank you. Um, and that information we'll send out in our follow-up email as well, so you can all check out that book um, afterwards. Um, we also have a question about, um, can you talk a little bit more about how your mother became involved in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum? Was that sort of an outgrowth of her work with um, the Carter administration, or um, how did she kind of get involved in that? So my, um, my mother opened up the Center for Holocaust Studies in Brooklyn. She opened up this Center for Holocaust Studies. As we said, Gerald Ford came to visit to campaign. And after um, Jimmy Carter won, Elie Wiesel and others spoke to President Carter and said, we want to uh, establish a museum about the Holocaust. And uh, my mother being a uh, well-known historian was brought in to be part of that commission. So she worked hand in hand with Elie Wiesel and they were planning what to do with this museum. One of the trips they took was a fact-finding mis mission to Europe. And when they were in Europe, a lot of the discussion was, okay, let's talk a lot about the concentration camp. Let's talk a lot about uh, the cattle cars. Let's talk a lot about the uh, destruction. And my mother said, we have to also present life. What was life before the shtetl? Who did they destroy? We're perpetuating this image of victimhood if we don't also portray life. So she embarked on her um, research on her shtetl and eventually that became that whole wing which showed life before the Holocaust. What was destroyed by all this? So the museum is really um, a museum of life, what happened before, but also look how everything was destroyed, how tragically uh, it all ended. But to appreciate when you look at the museum and you learn about these individuals to realize they were people just like you. And this is a whole shtetl that was practically all destroyed. Um, we also have another question. Um, what was your father's relationship to your mother's work? My, mo my mother was very passionate about her work and was very devoted. And my father was an amazing husband, so encouraging. He went with her to most of her uh, you know, lectures, encouraged her uh, to do her work, was very proud uh, of all her work. And that was very influential uh, for me and my brother as well, because they were really a couple and they did this together. I mean, he is was, excuse me, passed away last year. This was his first yard site recently at 99. He was a Jewish educator and he was the principal of Yeshiva Flatbush High School for many years. And he had his own uh, area of expertise and, and influence, but together they were really a power couple. They really um, helped each other and um, really encouraged each other. And I don't know if she would be able to really succeed without his uh, encouragement and without his good advice. And he also was very smart, very well read. And he really contributed a lot on all different levels uh, to my mother's work and she to his work in, in the school. So it really um, is very important to give my father a tremendous amount of credit because he was very encouraging and um, they were really uh, a couple and also did their own thing, but uh, they really uh, encouraged each other. And that was really a beautiful thing to see. That's amazing. Um, so I think this will be our last question. I'm just gonna kind of read it as it is in here. Um, thank you, Smidar, for an amazing program and for sharing your mother's story. Can you speak a bit more about your mother's influence on Holocaust museums and collections today and the power of personal studies and her decision to begin collecting personal objects from survivors long before many others? She truly influenced modern Holocaust museum collections today. Yes, meaning, <laughs> My mother did the first Center for Holocaust Studies. She was the first to interview survivors in a serious way. She was the first to collect pictures. She was the first to collect um, artifacts. She was the first to think that it would, there should be a museum and people would be uh, interested 
uh, in coming. Remember her um, Center for Holocaust Studies also had, you know, some exhibitions when uh, when possible. So my mother was really the pioneer, as I said, but I'm so happy to really emphasize it again. She was the pioneer. There would not be the type of commemoration, whether commemoration when people got together for Yom HaShoah, for Holocaust Memorial Day, or the way museums are structured, or the idea of oral history. As I said, it wasn't common then. People weren't interested in oral history as a viable area of historical research or of finding um, items that people really saved throughout the Holocaust or found when they went back, or the idea of uh, pictures. And my mother was really the pioneer in all of, in all of this. And none of these uh, museums would look like they do without her impact. And in the three main museums, I also want to say again that the Museum of Jewish Heritage, uh, the core archive and the core collection was donated by my mother because that was the uh, museum, that was the Center for Holocaust Studies, Documentation and Research. So the Museum of Jewish Heritage, the museum in Washington, Yad Vashem, would not look like they do without my mother's contribution and the Museum of Jewish Heritage, especially uh, the core is uh, my mother's material. And it was she who thought of having this museum in New York. And that's why she was willing to close the Center for Holocaust Studies and that uh, she would donate it to the museum. Then it was an idea for the future that it would uh, be a very important place, not only to uh, remember the Holocaust, but to commemorate life before the Holocaust and the lessons that we have to learn from the Holocaust. And I think that uh, her legacy, in addition to um, people who research the Holocaust, really the museums are spreading that message and her influence in all these museums is very strong. And I'm very gratified to see that. 